Hello. There is a universal link to food. Since the early days of hunting gathering, humans have needed food to sustain life. Over time, we've developed socially and physically to accommodate certain dietary needs in unique situations in order to survive. However, we do have limits. As Dr. Malcolm says in Jurassic Park, your scientists were so preoccupied that they could, that they didn't stop to think if they should. Many human beings have tested this theory with things that are physically possible for them to consume, but ultimately harmful to them, and in some cases, deadly. In this video, I will not be discussing foods that are considered quote, unhealthy, as that is extremely subjective and has been covered by so many other more qualified people. Just as an example, there's a man out there right now who has eaten at the time of me writing this over 32,600 Big Macs over the course of his entire life. And while that is a whole lot of hamburgers and fat, Don Gorska's health is considered relatively good. He's still alive and continues to eat at least one Big Mac a day. Other people would not fare quite as well, which highlights how subjective the healthy versus unhealthy debate can be. The types of examples I will cover with this topic range from things you should not consume at all, to some items that are just way too wild not to mention that I stumbled across while doing research for this video. Speaking of things way too wild not to mention, let me tell you about our sponsor for today, PuttingYourSocialSecurity.com. Uh, <laughs> No, there is not a sponsor, but again, if you don't mind and you like the content, go on over to PuttingYourSocialSecurity.com and you can subscribe to my Patreon and help support me make more of these videos. So, thank you for that, and let's get right back into the video, why don't we? Now back to talking about things that are edible, but deadable. Plutonium, which does have a calorie count, by the way, and according to memes, which, as we all know, are the best sources for information on the internet, taste pear-like and sour. But according to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, as well as one chemist named Donald F. Mastic, who accidentally ingested some plutonium, it tastes very metallic-like and had negative effects on his body for years. So please, please don't eat plutonium. Before I get into the next topic, some of these descriptions about what happened to certain people when they consumed certain things can be a bit graphic. However, I will not be showing any graphic images of these things. If you need to skip certain sections, I completely understand. With that warning out of the way, Let's jump into a real downer and talk about liver from predator animals. Now, if you know much about nutrition and biology, this one might be pretty self-explanatory. But for those of us that don't, like myself before I did any research, this is your warning. If you ever find yourself stuck in a remote location, somewhere like Antarctica, for example, there's a rule that certain groups of people, specifically the Inuit tribe, learned a very long time ago. Do not eat the liver of a predator animal. For the Inuit tribe, this meant polar bears and seals. This advice seems pretty strange on the surface, right? Like, people cook up liver all the time, it's sold in stores, there are entire meals centering around it. So what makes a predator animal's liver any different? While on an expedition to Antarctica, a group of explorers led by a man named Douglas Mawson found out the answer to that very question. The problem with a predator animal's liver is that it is full of vitamin A. Like, full of vitamin A. In most cases, vitamin A isn't a problem as our bodies will eventually absorb about 70 to 90% of it in our own livers. But there are rare cases and stories of people that have developed a condition called hypervitaminosis A. This condition is not usually fatal, but for this group of three explorers in 1912, it is said that it might have been what caused one man to die, and another man to narrowly survive. As you can imagine, going to Antarctica is extremely dangerous, and would have been even more so over 100 years ago. These guys suffered setback after setback losing supplies, a sled, dogs, and more. And when you thought it couldn't get any worse, it did. Lieutenant Belgrave Ninnis fell into a chasm suspected to be more than 150 feet deep, taking a very large amount of their equipment and food with him. He died from this fall. The remaining two men read Ninnis' funeral rites, counted their losses, and trudged on. But the thought of starvation began to worry them very quickly. Due to this fear, they made the decision to eat one of their weakest dogs, ate on every part of it, including the liver and fed what remained to the other dogs. The expedition continued on, and they ate what they could, including more of their husky companions as they grew weaker. Over the next few days, the duo's pace slowed, and Xavier Mertz had begun to lose his hair, skin, and showed signs of dysentery. Shortly after, he passed away in his sleep peacefully, according to Mawson. After that, Mawson began to show signs of intense skin pain, describing his pain in detail as, quote, My whole body is apparently rotting from want of proper nourishment frostbitten fingertips, festerings, mucous membranes of nose gone, saliva glands of mouth refusing duty, skin coming off the whole body, end quote. 
I'll spare you the details any further, just know that the symptoms got worse. We do know of this expedition though because Mawson somehow survived and wrote a record of what had transpired during the trek. With the knowledge we have now, and using Mawson's account of the events, many scientists believe that both Mawson and Mertz had symptoms from eating the liver of the dogs. Mertz might have been fed even more of the liver as he suffered, thinking it would be easier to chew and digest, but it ended up being his demise. Of course, some of the group's issues stemmed from the harshness of the Antarctic, but this serves as a cautionary tale to never eat a predator animal's liver. Now how about a warm beverage after all that talk of cold Antarctica? Why not try some tea? Well, most tea is just perfectly fine. I myself love a good tea. But there's one kind of tea that the FDA warns against. Comfrey tea. Comfrey tea has been used for over 2,000 years as an herbal medicine, and it's said that it helps with muscle soreness, wound healing, and pain relief. Sounds pretty helpful, right? Well, no. Since 2001, comfrey tea has been listed as a possible poisonous plant because it contains pyrrolizidine alkaloids, which are known to damage the liver and is a possible carcinogen. If you do a quick search for a comfrey tea, there's a lot of information that it's dangerous to consume, but not too much further down. There are links to Amazon and places to purchase it, where it's advertised as just loose leaf tea. Without the right knowledge, someone could easily purchase this thinking it's another type of tea that they haven't tried before. If you scroll down just a little bit on VeryWellFit.com, it lists all these positive effects, including treatment of broken bones, better skin, treatment of bronchitis, and cancer prevention of all things. If you continue scrolling, it says that it is only recommended that you apply comfrey tea externally to unbroken skin, and only for a maximum of 10 days. I personally feel like this is some sick joke. It might be poison, but you can have it delivered to your door with other household essentials. So, this is future Gurdon. Um, I, I have to jump in and interject here really quickly. While doing editing on the comfrey tea section, I stumbled across this page right here. It's a thing where you can buy comfrey tea just directly off of Amazon. And I just want to point out a couple things here because I couldn't not include this. If you look here, it says, yes, here's some ways to prepare it and prepare it over tea with the herb cover and steep enjoy. Does not say, do not ingest. Let me say that right now. It literally says, do, like, nothing along those lines of don't ingest. But <laughs> the part below that is what really got me. Um, is specifically, comfort tea is supposed to be used for traveler protection. Good luck, protection again, grounding, and money drawing. So, you can take this tea with you and do these things. But there's a couple bullet points underneath it that I really, really had to hit on really quickly. Wrap your money in a comfrey leaf for several days before going to a casino or poker game. It will help keep your bets coming back to you. That's kind of out there. The next two are kind of about, or fine about using it in a bath to help with love spells and other spells and stuff like that. And if, if you want to cast some spells using comfrey, go right ahead. But the fourth one down here is where I really, really, really had to hit on. Place a little comfrey in your suitcases to prevent theft. Open parentheses, this is the important part. Just make sure you don't leave it in there if going through biosecurity. Because if you do, it can be flagged as a poison. This is... I feel like I am absolutely going insane. You, This is an Amazon page. This is just a regular... There's multiple of these. But it even says specifically in the fine print, hey, don't take this through an airport because you'll get in trouble. Like, it's insane to me. I'm so sorry to, to just jump in here with this, but now back to your regularly scheduled video. While we are discussing things with supposed health benefits, I want to mention an incident that could have easily been prevented if people had more access to information and safeguards in place. I want to start by reading a letter that was written by Dr. Archie S. Calhoun to the then President of the United States at the time, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, about an incident called the sulfonilamide disaster. Quote, Nobody but Almighty God and I can know what I have been through these past few days. I have been familiar with death in the years since I received my MD from Tulane University School of Medicine with the rest of my class in 1911. Covington County has been my home. I have practiced here for years. Any doctor who has practiced more than a quarter of a century has seen his share of death. But to realize that six human beings, all of them my patients, one of them my best friend, are dead because they took medicine that I prescribed for them innocently, and to realize that that medicine which I had used for years in such cases suddenly had become a deadly poison in its newest and most modern form, as recommended by a great and reputable pharmaceutical firm in Tennessee, 
Well, that realization has given me such days and nights of mental and spiritual agony as I did not believe a human being could undergo and survive. I have known hours where death for me would be a welcome relief from this agony." End quote. This incident led FDR to approve the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Acts of 1938. This federal act later reformed the FDA as we know it today. There was a time in US history where drugs weren't required to be tested for toxicity on humans or animals at all, which probably doesn't surprise you. It was frowned upon to sell drugs that were either ineffective or dangerous, but it was not illegal to sell a toxic substance. So that's exactly what happened in some cases. Sulfonilamides were used at the time as they cured a strep throat and other similar bacteria-like infections. They usually came in a powder or tablet form. So when word traveled that people were looking for a liquid form, it was the S.E. Massingill Co. in Bristol, Tennessee that took it upon themselves to find a way to dissolve the sulfonilamide, and thus a liquid form was created. S.E. Massingill Co.'s chief chemist and pharmacist, Harold Cole Watkins, had found the perfect recipe. Sulfonilamides dissolved in diethylene glycol. Excited with their findings, they ran tests to refine the flavor, viscosity, appearance, and fragrance. They found a formula that worked with a nice raspberry flavor. They compounded up a very large amount of their new concoction and shipped out 633 containers all over the United States. Now, the S.E. Massingo Company and their pharmacist ran plenty of tests for flavor, fragrance, and appearance, right? But they didn't run any safety tests for pharmacological studies. Essentially what they shipped out was raspberry flavored diethylene glycol with some light antibiotics in it. If you're not familiar with the name diethylene glycol, you might actually have some in your house right now. It's a chemical that's most commonly used in antifreeze, and when ingested it is a deadly poison. So this new formula was sent out to various places across the United States, and the fallout from the toxic drug started shortly after. News of deaths from the liquid formula first came from Tulsa, Oklahoma. The American Medical Association was notified of these deaths, and an investigation began. But at this point, it's too late. They got a sample of the medicine and found the source of it to be the S.E. Massingill Co. and found diethylene glycol in the liquid form. Due to these findings, the American Medical Association issued a warning to the newspaper and radio. Eventually, word hit New York and finally the FDA was notified. By this time though, eight children and one adult had died from taking this so-called medicine. Quote, They suffered intense and unrelenting pain. At the time, there was no known antidote or treatment for diethylene glycol poisoning." End quote. In the end, the FDA, with help from many physicians and doctors, were able to track down 234 gallons of the original 240 that had been shipped out. Charges were made against the S.E. Massengill Co., but not for what you would expect. In the end, there were 25 charges of mislabeling for this incident. The reason for this was because if you were to sell something labeled as an elixir, it has to contain at least some alcohol. The liquid sulfonilamide concoction only contained powdered sulfonilamide, raspberry flavoring, and diethylene glycol, which is not an elixir. This actually ended up being the saving grace though for the FDA, as if it had been called a solution and not an elixir, then there were no charges that could have been made against the S.E. Massengill Co. If it was a solution, the FDA would have had their hands tied illegally in trying to recover and seize all of this poison. Now, here's the kicker on top of all of this. Like I mentioned earlier, no testing of toxicity was required at this time. And there was no law in 1937 that prohibited the sale of dangerous, untested, and or poisonous drugs. Dr. Samuel Evans Massengill, the owner of the S.E. Massengill Company, stated after the entire ordeal, quote, My chemist and I deeply regret the fatal results, but there was no error in the manufacture of the product. We have been supplying a legitimate professional demand, and not once could have foreseen the unlooked-for results. I do not feel that there was any responsibility on our part, end quote. Unfortunately, this was not the first instance of glycol poisoning, as the first reports on the dangers of glycol poisoning in general were first described in 1930, seven whole years before the sulfonilamide disaster. Due to the 105 deaths from this incident, the head chemist I mentioned earlier, Harold Cole Watkins, ended up taking his own life after learning of the lives that were lost from his formula. Now, there are other cases of people ingesting glycol and passing away, a lot of them if I'm being honest. These cases include a toothpaste poisoning, a cough syrup poisoning, a beer, a teething medication for babies, and of course the 1985 Austrian wine poisoning scandal. So many of those instances have stemmed from people cutting corners to save money or shipping out subpar products to countries thinking no one would catch on. If you are still interested in the specific substance, please go watch the amazing Down the Rabbit Hole series on the 1985 Austrian wine poisoning scandal by the amazing Frederick Knudsen, where he covers the incident in much more depth. Now that I've talked about dog liver, toxic tea, and poison throat syrup, I think it's time I covered a topic that's a little lighter. So let's talk about pears. Pears are usually called stone fruit, 
stone fruit have a pit or stone in the center, and are surrounded by a fleshy exterior. Now there's a fun fact about stone fruit that you may already know. The pit of these fruits are actually dangerous to eat, because they contain amygdalin, which the body naturally breaks down in your stomach to create hydrogen cyanide. According to the Poison Control website, while swallowing the pit of a stone fruit generally doesn't cause any issue, the real issues arise if you were to chew up, crush it, or open the pits and then eat them. Now that you know these facts about pears, keep that in mind while I tell you a story. The Roman Emperor Claudius had a son sometime between 9 and 12 AD, and his name was Tiberius Claudius Drusus, and this young boy was betrothed to be married around the time of him becoming a man. But that day didn't come, as he ended up dying allegedly from a pear. While some historians argue over whether he died from a pear or an assassination attempt, as what happened in Roman time. Surprisingly, the pear is the more believed theory. It's believed that young Tiberius Claudius Drusus was playing with a pear and throwing it into the air, when he was somehow, quote, strangled by a pear, which had been thrown into the air in play and caught in his open mouth, end quote. Now the story sounds weird, but according to Suetonius, who recorded the history of the Roman Emperor Claudius, he believed the assassination theory was unlikely, because the accused was the mother of who Tiberius Claudius Drusus was to be betrothed to, which didn't make much sense. It seemed much more likely a tragic accident. Also, it would have been due to choking on the pear, not from being poisoned from the pit of the pear, so consider the facts from earlier a bonus nugget of knowledge. And while I'm on the subject of people that died from foods in ways that you wouldn't have expected, did you know that a former member of the British Parliament died while on a hunting trip from falling onto a turnip of all things? Not just that, but apparently he died from, quote, severe internal injuries, end quote. Interestingly enough, Sir William Payne Galway, second baronet, was 74 and had recently stepped down as Thirsk's MP after 28 years due to declining health. However, his cause of death ended up being from falling on a turnip. I'll close the video on what was one of the most bizarre cases of death from ingesting something that I found while researching. Knives. At the age of 23 years old, an American sailor named John Cummings watched a circus performance with knife swallowers, and he became fascinated by the idea. Without much thought and no prior experience other than that he witnessed it at the circus, John began to practice his own knife swallowing acts. One night, while trying to impress his sailing buddies, he decided to swallow a knife of his own. He swallowed the entire knife and washed it down with some alcohol afterwards. His buddies were probably pretty impressed. After showing off a bit, he decided to swallow three more knives that night and according to reports, he ended up passing the knives through his system with no problems. Six years after impressing his buddies for the first time, he told more sailors about that glorious night he swallowed four knives. Once he finished his story, he was most likely peer pressured into showing this crowd of sailors that he was actually serious. John Cummings stood up, walked in front of the crowd of sailors, and swallowed a knife. The sailors were impressed by this alone, but to show off even more, throughout the night he swallowed five more knives. After this evening of swallowing six knives total, word spread quickly that there was a madman who actually swallowed knives. The next morning, he was greeted by groups of people asking him to do it again, and he did, eight more times that morning. This brings up the total amount of knives that John swallowed in roughly a day's time, to a whopping 14 knives. The next day, John woke up and felt awful. He had extreme stomach pain and began vomiting to the point of needing to go to the hospital. Wildly enough, after a short visit to the hospital, he was released and went home with no issue. Now you'd think that after swallowing 14 knives in 24 hours, to the point that you need to go to the hospital even, that you'd stop and realize you shouldn't be doing that. But no, not John Cummings. A few months after his hospital trip, he was back on a ship again, and someone mentioned his famous knife swallowing abilities. By this point, you can probably assume that John was very proud of this ability and decided to show more people his knife swallowing talent. This time, he swallowed 17 knives, his biggest record yet. Unfortunately though, John did not get so lucky this time. For the next roughly three and a half years, John was in constant pain, saying he quote, felt like death and suspected that his bowels had dropped. Eventually, after many hospital visits where he passed fragments of knives, metal, springs, and wood, John Cummings died in March of 1809 from his injuries. That sure was a ride, wasn't it? When I set out to make this video, I wanted to talk about a couple things like comfrey tea and the sulfonilamide disaster as a way to highlight things that can be dangerous without the right knowledge or safety measures. But I also found some interesting things that people have consumed that I thought would be common sense not to, like knives. 
Obviously, most people know and are taught not to consume things labeled as toxic or not to eat household items like drywall or nails, but I wanted to share some examples that you might not have heard about as a cautionary tale that there are a lot of things out there that are not safe for consumption. And before I read the names of the lovely people on Patreon and PuttingYourSocialSecurity.com who make it possible for me to create content like this, I know that I said in the last video that the next video would be on the placebo effect. Um, I still very much want to do that video. I wanted to do something a little bit more fun and informative without really getting into the depths of the placebo and the nocebo effect. So it's still going to be made, but this is the topic that was voted for on Patreon or again, put in your social security.com. And I just want to thank you all again for understanding. And I hope you really enjoyed this. It means a lot. So if you, if you don't mind leaving just a uh, hit, hit, hit the like button. Sure. Hit, you can hit the subscribe too. That's real fun. A special thank you to all of my patrons, but especially to Hakai Mono, Vluminati, Glitch Lich, Ty, Campfire Harvest, Bok Bok Chucky, Serial Killing, Carta, Just Underscore DJ, I Love Your SSN, Richard Dixon, Lorian, Tribal Trash 18, Lil Parsnip, Not to be confused with Mr. Stinky, Junipy, and a very big special thank you to these people who've gone above and beyond to Chris O.P., Pato, Anyo Rosin, and Drove Singal. Thank you all so very much for the support. If you want to follow up to this or more of this, please let me know or whatever you would like to see next on the channel. I have a lot of ideas, but I would just love to hear yours. With that, though, um, I'm going to sign off. This has been Gurdon, and let's blow this popsicle stand.